This is a practical iOS app security talk. Uh, my name is Chris Ferrant. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton. I'm a senior associate there. I lead the app critique team, which focuses on mobile forensics, uh, network analysis of uh, publicly available apps, as well as enterprise developed apps. And uh, we do this for clients that are interested in understanding the risks and mitigations uh, before they deploy their apps out to their user base. I also teach uh, iOS development for uh, Totem, and I write, uh, iOS uh, write iOS apps for my own company called Tenant. Um, this conference is awesome so far. I, uh, I want to thank Nemo for reminding me about how horrible Objective-C is, and the fact that I did not write a line of code of Objective-C almost a year now, uh, thanks to Swift. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, for me, I, I can't stand Objective-C. And, you know, he proved that. Uh, also, Patrick, thanks for tasking up my weekend to uh, wipe all of my machines when I get home. I have a, a four Max that I'm going to now format and go get knock knock and block block. And I have to do my wife's computer because God knows what she's downloading. Um, and I just will use my iPad for now on for everything. So as, as soon as Apple can come out with Xcode for iPad, I don't need my MacBook anymore and I can just not worry about that talk. But that was pretty scary. Uh, this talk is definitely going to be a different perspective. So it's a little break for you guys. Uh, there is going to be code, but it's not going to be exploit code. Uh, my last few years have been mostly on the developer side, and uh, I have a cybersecurity background as well, so I'm trying to apply that to how apps should be developed. And when they're not developed correctly, where, do you, where can you go see where these problems manifest themselves? Uh, it's definitely not obvious with mobile. It's, a, it's a definitely a niche type of thing. It's not like a desktop operating system where everyone knows what the file system looks like and everything is very available to you to go and see. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that only developers know dealing with certain APIs. So I want to try to bring that to the forefront. Um, just a quick raise of hands. How many actual iOS app developers are in this room right now? Okay, that's what I thought. Four. <laughs> Um, okay, so how many people are interested in iOS app development from a forensic perspective, network analysis perspective? Okay, a lot, a lot more, definitely. Okay, that's good. Um, Android users? Get out. Just <laughs> seriously, wrong conference. Um, I, I am a slight fanboy of, of the platform, uh, but I do understand the security vulnerabilities. There's security vulnerabilities in everything, so. Um, Take this talk with a grain of salt, and you know everything that I show you. There's always three or three or six different ways uh, to beat beat that, as you know the, the guys before me showed. So, what I want to focus on with this talk is uh, four main topics, four main buckets. I'm going to go over iOS app security in general, just kind of a primer, so that we can get everyone on the same page in here. Uh, this, like I said, it's a, definitely a mix of, of folks that are uh, coming with different skill sets. Um, so, you know, there's some high-level stuff in here, and there's just some basic iOS architecture uh, level set that I want to do. Then I want to talk about Swift. And like I said, I haven't written a line of code of Objective-C since WWDC last year. That's how much I love Swift. Um, I, I taught Objective-C for three years. I found it very difficult. Um, I was never a C developer, so coming from a, a true C background, I had to learn Objective-C on top of kind of learning, you know, good C. And uh, it's very difficult to stay safe as a C programmer. It's just a lot of ways you can shoot yourself in your foot. Objective-C never fixed that. It just slapped on top of it. I think Nemo said it. Uh, it's a superset. So everything you could do in C, you can do in Objective-C with a whole bunch of other stuff. So we'll talk about Swift, where it's at, um, why I think it's great. There's a lot of concepts in Swift that are new to iOS developers that maybe other language uh, programmers are like, well, that's not, you know, that's old hat. But in the iOS world, totally different. I should say in, just in the Apple world in general. Um, then we're going to build an app. So I'm going to do the number one thing you should never do on stage anywhere, and that's to do a live demo of code or programming or tools. I'm going to do all of that. Um, I wrote, wrote an app, we, uh, I snapshotted it six times, so I have six different versions of this app we're going to go through. And uh, I'm going to show you forensically uh, stuff that, you know, this particular app that was written vulnerable on purpose and kind of just weak practices on purpose, where that stuff manifests itself. And 
Finally, the, the last bucket is just kind of the random stuff that's left over. Um, there's a whole lot of iOS topics that you know we need to cover. I can't cover them in an hour. I also don't know every single little nook and cranny uh, of the of the platform in terms of uh, network security and, and mobile forensics. But I'll cover as much as I can uh, before the, my my time's up here. Okay, so let's let's start off uh, with the basics. The statement is it is it real? Is this is this the truth? Just little desktop, right? That's all it is. I got it in my pocket. I pull it out. I got Excel. I got all sorts of cool apps on there. Um, definitely not. Not not the case. Um, the world sees mobile as that. You know, it's very usable. It's it is a, it is a computer in your desktop. It's super powerful. It's got advanced processing, advanced operating systems. Uh, but when it actually comes to designing the software to make it correct and uh, performance-wise, it's good and it's secure. Uh, definitely not going to follow desktop paradigms. So mobile's different. There's different use cases. You use your device totally differently. Everyone, you know, has a mobile phone now, and we know how what those use cases are. You check your Facebook, you play Angry Birds, whatever. Um, but the use cases change. Like I have an Apple Watch now. Anybody have an Apple Watch? I saw three people. I know where you're sitting. Uh, or are those guys developers also that raise their hands? Did you get the developer edition? No, I won the uh, golden ticket raffle for this guy. So, uh, so the use cases continually change, and I'm using my my Apple Watch totally di different than I use my mobile device or my my cell phone. That's totally different how I use my iPad. So these are all different use cases. Uh, the mobile OSs are very tailored. So again, this isn't Windows or, or Unix or Linux that you're sitting down with a screen in front of you and you're, you're doing different things and you're in the file system and you have a file manager and you have a start button and all this cool stuff, just different. Major fragmented hardware issues, so there's, uh, especially you know, in the Android world, there's um, lots of different platforms and devices that are out there, different vendors, different make and models. Uh, some have certain capabilities like biometrics, some don't, and uh, this all leads to kind of fragmentation. You don't have this as much on the desktop. Uh, amount of a lifetime. So you don't use these devices the same way you use a desktop. You use your desktop for hours at a time. You're making stuff. You're creating. You're not only consuming, but you're also you're creating. Um, you're, you're doing quite quite a bit of computing power on a desktop. A mobile device, you're going to use that thing for minutes at a time. So the scale is totally different. Whatever it is that you're doing, it should be done in probably less than a minute. Uh, and then even worse on the Apple Watch, you do not want to have your wrist held up for a minute. I mean, you might think that you're strong and you can do that, but do that throughout the entire day for minutes at a time where you're actually writing a keynote presentation, that's not going to fly on the watch. So now you're talking seconds. Um, you know, and then they start embedding the chips in your head and you're talking nanoseconds. And that's 10 years down the line. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, different development paradigms. So as a, an iOS developer or an Android developer or just mobile in general, there's different patterns that you use to construct software than there is on the desktop. There's just totally different architecture that you can take advantage of. Top of that, iOS is even more different. So it's a very controlled environment. Um, there, there are things that you can do and things that just don't exist. It's not that you can't do them, it's just they're not there. Uh, it's not that you know, Apple says that thou shalt not you know, use this. If it doesn't exist, you can't make that device actually do that. So here's some of the cornerstones that I see with iOS. Sandboxing is obviously huge. Uh, the, the first two talks talked about sandboxing from a desktop perspective. The sandboxing on, on iOS is very good. Um, the, most of the sandboxing stuff that I'm going to talk about is more like the file system sandbox that uh, the app resides in and the directories that get created per app. And then also uh, when you start using shared containers, what also gets created in, in that regards. So with sandboxing, um, We'll, we'll kind of go through uh, when, I, when I get my app up and running here in the third part. I'll actually show you where in the sandbox certain files are created and so on. Controlled API usage. Uh, there's a set of API you can use on the good list, and then there's nothing else. So it's, it's a very controlled environment. Um, the one thing about the APIs, they change often in mobile. So the, the scale and the rapidness that we're talking about with mobile development, it's always changing. Every nine months, there's a new operating system out. Um, you know, in three months before that, you know about all the new additions that are going to be in it. So, and they're, they're pretty epic changes. They're not just like little patches that add one feature. Sometimes entire frameworks 
get replaced by other frameworks that do something totally different. Background modes on mobile, it's not like you're using your Windows computer at home and you hit the little minimize button and it goes down to the start bar and sits there and you know is doing all sorts of cool stuff or there's processes launched in the background because you, you lit up an app and you minimized it. Um, on iOS, it's pretty much, it's either running in the foreground or it's kind of frozen in the background. Uh, there's a couple different options, maybe about nine of them, uh, where you can put the app in a different mode, but it's a very specific reason why that app should be running in the background and you get a limited amount of time of stuff that you can do within that uh, window. Code signing and entitlements. Um, code signing was talked about earlier today. That's a huge malware breaker. It's a, you know, you, you have to plan to get around that kind of stuff. iOS, every app that runs on iOS has to be code signed. Entitlements are added uh, as the developer needs to add new things to their code. Like let's say they have to start doing data protection on their uh, sandbox or they need to turn on CloudKit and they, they want to start saving up to iCloud. Uh, these are all different entitlements that you add to your project before you compile it. Uh, and these are all things that also have to match in the iTunes developer portal, in iTunes, um, the de developer center. So not only do you turn them on in Xcode, but you log into your portal and you make sure that you know, it's configured correctly and that when you ship your um, bundle up to Apple, everything matches up. And then of course app review. So this is a big one that didn't exist a whole lot before mobile came around. Um, this is pretty pinnacle. I mean, if someone's going to review your binaries before they get deployed out to devices, that's a whole other system that's checking for maliciousness, checking for things that shouldn't be done, checking for uh, certain laws not to be broken. Um, it's definitely an important one that doesn't happen very much on the desktop. Very, very small um, window to do that. And trust. So trust is a very big one. And when I say trust for iOS, I mean device pairing. And you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, at a later talk today, but this is a pretty big uh, component that keeps your device safe when you're you know, uh, out and about and if you lose it, uh, it, it's nice that someone can just plug it in and then automatically get access to all your files. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So all these things together, this is kind of like in the cybersecurity world, um, layers, of, uh, layers of security. The more, the more onion layers you have, the tougher it is to get into the center. And uh, that's exactly the way iOS was architected. It has a whole lot of things that would have to be kind of knocked down in order to get in. And uh, Patrick's talk showed that on Mac as well. So sandboxing, real quick, it's basically uh, a, couple a couple directories that your app gets. There's a bundle directory, and this is as of uh, iOS 8. They separated out the data directory from your, your bundle. And your bundle directory has like your images, the actual executable itself, and that's sitting over here in, in another folder. Your data directory is where you as a developer store all of your data. So if you're generating user data, you're generating um, whatever it is, preferably not just sensitive data in the clear, but whatever your, your app does, this is the local storage place where you're going you're gonna to store your data, typically in the documents folder. But there is stuff that goes to library, and that's uh, what we're going to be talking about later. So once you install an app, um, it can't just start talking to the other apps on the phone. There's no default mechanism to just for the, the phone to you know have one app automatically send a stream of data to another. The developer has to ahead of time plan for that and there's a couple different ways that that actually can occur normally. So the, the three big ones right now, and the first one's very old, uh, custom URL schemes. This has been around since early, early iOS days. Uh, basically what uh, a custom URL scheme is, uh, well I'll, I'll hold off because we're going we're gonna to see that. Um, app extensions is new with iOS 8. This is kind of the new preferred way to share data between apps. And this is very user driven also. This is that new stuff that you see now when you hit the little action button that has the arrow popping up out of it. Um, and then a new panel pops up and says, what do you want to share this to? Maybe it's a photo and you want to send it over to like a filter, an app that does filters on that photo. Uh, that's typically done through like app extensions now. And of course, AirDrop. Uh, not many people use AirDrop. It's pretty neat. Uh, it, you know, it's an ad hoc very quick uh, file transfer uh, over Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So here's custom URL schemes, just a quick overview for those that have not uh, seen these before. If I write an app called my app and I want another app to be able to send my app data, I would register a URL scheme. And it's just, you know, it looks just like HTTP colon slash slash. I'm going to register in this case here, my app colon. My app is my custom scheme. 
Now, any other app on that device can actually call open URL in Objective-C or in Swift, it's just part of the Cocoa, Cocoa library, uh, pass that URL in, and you'll actually see my app open up on the screen. So this is the transaction that you see when you're using certain apps, and you do something, and then all of a sudden, that app goes into the background, and then the app that is receiving actually pops up. This is the mechanism that does that. Notice the format here. So you can stick whatever you want in that, uh, as parameters, as data. You can stick obfuscated strings in there. Whatever data you actually want to pass, this is the structure you can abide by. There's also uh, kind of like an open source uh, schema that most people go by called xcallback URL, and there's a website for it, and you can go check it out. It basically provides some structure to what developers should put in here if they want their apps to be able to talk back uh, to the original app and actually call back. There's also third-party libraries that'll help you out with that. So app extensions, I talked about most of these. This is the, uh, the common list of, of um, the ones that are out there. I added Watch, watch Kit to that, that's brand new. App extensions, this is the panel um, that you've used before. Uh, this is actually a built-in mechanism that has, the developer has to uh, institute ahead of time. It's not just like all these apps listed on the left can automatically grab this, this photo just because it's a photos app. And AirDrop, typically used for file transfer, um, and it can be programmatic as well. So you can actually write your app, uh, and it doesn't have to be a user-initiated thing where you're you know, clicking on this person, Alex, here, and dragging or selecting them and, and transferring whatever it is that you have on the screen there, that mail message or whatever. Uh, you can programmatically access AirDrop to push files to another app or um, a, an app on another device, assuming that it's going to handle that appropriately on the other end. So the background modes that I mentioned, this is the list of them. Um, basically, you are one of these, or uh, you don't run the background. Uh, and again, this is in a pristine, normal iOS uh, environment that you know, is used as it is intended. So you're an audio app, you're a VoIP app. These are things that are given time in the background that can actually still be running when you hit the home button. So that app can go in the background. But again, the developer has to set that up ahead of time in Xcode. Uh, they have to get the entitlement for whatever it is they're doing and then um, add whatever code to handle this kind of stuff. Background fetch. Is, uh, this is also something that's controlled. So it might sound like it's a nice one where you can just have the thing sit in the background and it can constantly update itself. This is a controlled mechanism that iOS chooses to allow your app to go and update on a certain interval. And that interval is controlled by iOS, not by you. So you can't just say every 20 minutes, go to the server and pull down these files. It's, it's more of a, um, a known uh, interval. So if you're not one of those, you are frozen in carbonite and you just sit in the background. You're, you're, uh, it might look like you're running, but you're just a photo, uh, and I'm gonna show you where those photos get stored, and that's pretty much a common uh, thing now, uh, but what's not common is developers cleaning those photos up in case they have sensitive information on them. So another cornerstone that I mentioned was uh, code signing, controlled app usage, API usage, entitlements, app review. These are all kind of the developer ecosystem that you're a part of if you're an iOS developer. This is uh, there's something that you, you live with. This is, these are the different uh, kind of tenants that you live by. Entitlements are things that you have to request in order to access them. You can't just write a chunk of code in Objective-C or Swift and call some libraries uh, in Foundation or CloudKit or uh, some data protection class if you didn't actually get the entitlement for it ahead of time. And then trust. So, we talked about trust, this is really device pairing. So this is what happens when you plug your phone in. You see this screen, and you'll see it on uh, you know, your, your machine as well as uh, the device itself. So when you click trust, it generates a key. Uh, this is the folder on the Mac where those keys get stored, and you can go and see them. Um, it's not as obvious to understand how to get trust off of the device. There is a reset location privacy, and I think that just the general reset all on the phone will also get rid of them. So if you're worried that you know you trusted your phone to like 17 laptops over the last couple of years, uh, although you probably updated iOS a lot since then, um, this is a way to get rid of them all and kind of start with a, a blank slate. Okay, so with trust, once you get trust, you can plug your device in, and with certain tools, you can get access to your sandbox. 
Uh, you can also back up your device. So that, that's, a, that's a key piece if you want to back up locally. Uh, as of iOS 8.3, they made a pretty big change with uh, this whole trust issue and what you can and can't read out of the sandbox. So right now it's pretty much the apps that you've developed that you've used your developer uh, certificate on and uh, I guess and enterprise apps and uh, apps that have iTunes file sharing enabled which is kind of a weird um, mechanism that isn't used very often but you know if it is turned on then you can still see those files in the uh, sandbox that are that are shared so the tools that I'm talking about with this particular step would be like iExplorer or some of the command line tools out there that you can use to get access to the file system iOS doesn't have as you know a you know, file manager. So with the backups, you do get a lot more after you gain trust. You do a full backup. It's got uh, even the third-party apps, the documents, the library, and the temp folders are available uh, in there for you to, to kind of browse around in. So you can see what kind of data these apps are storing in there if you get a full backup. Uh, you do get OS-level data as well, the data that's specific to your phone and all of the apps that Apple gives you on iOS you would definitely want that stuff restored when you, you know, restore it. Without trust, you pretty much are a charger. You plug it in and you get the beep and you're charging your phone. That's, that's all you're going to say. So there is a, a policy, a profile that you can create using Apple Configurator and sometimes folks that manage MDM servers that deploy out, you know, hundreds of devices, thousands of devices will uh, create profiles that will lock down the phone. Now one of those settings that you probably would want to consider if you're worried about having trust, trust granted on you know, random devices in your enterprise uh, is this checkbox here. To allow devices to connect to other Macs, you want to uncheck that. And what that will do is it'll make it that device only trustable to that original machine that set that up. So the, the machine that's running this Apple configurator at that point. Um, that's a big layer of that onion that we just talked about. Uh, that could, you know, knock out quite a bit. And again, these are uh, this tool here. You can go get out of the Mac App Store. It's called App Apple Configurator. Uh, MDM servers also have policy configuration tools in them as well. Okay, so the second part of the talk is Swift. Real quick, I want to get through just some high-level things of why Swift is different than Objective C in terms of security. So. Yes, it's modern and expressive. That's a big reason why you know Swift is kind of uh, where it's at today. Objective C is not easy to read. It's not easy to write. I heard numerous comments when I was standing outside about just the square brackets. I think I heard the square brackets comment and complaint like ten times. Um, I actually, w before Swift came out, I thought Objective C was fairly elegant. And then when I saw Swift, I, it just that that went away very quickly. Um, but Swift is very modern. It's, ex it's expressive. It's bringing things from procedural, object-oriented, and functional programming languages into it. So it's kind of borrowing a lot of concepts from a lot of other really cool languages that you just can't use for um, iOS. So it's fast, soon. Um, the big sell uh, at WWDC last year was that, you know, this thing is tailored for us. It's, it's iOS and Mac OS X. Um, but right now, you know, it's, it still relies a lot on Objective-C runtime. It rise, relies 100% on it. Uh, it's, so it's not running on the hardware alone yet because there are no frameworks that are written in Swift that are uh, Apple native frameworks and I suppose over the next few years you're going to see things start to convert very quickly. Safe by default, so the concepts and the goal behind Swift was that it was going to be hard for developers to screw themselves basically. Uh, by default, if you just do the normal things in the language, it will make it so that you're not prone to buffer overflows, or you're not prone to having some sort of uh, mistyped variable or something like that. The language itself was designed around those concepts. And it is easy to adop adopt only because you can run Swift files within an Xcode project that has Objective-C in it. So if you have, a, if you have an uh, Objective-C only app and you just want to try out Swift, you can add just a class or two and you can drop the files right in Xcode with that same project and it'll build and run. So it's uh, definitely compatible with Objective-C. That being said, as you can probably already imagine, that brings Objective-C's vulnerabilities and everything that these guys discussed this morning, uh, still, they're still in play because Swift is not running just natively on its own yet. Okay, so I have a playground that I created that'll go through some of these uh, things just to kind of point these out. These are the real high-level uh, concepts that I want to show you. 
I think I'm going to lose Keynote here, so. Okay. Is that font big enough for you guys in the back? It's not. All right. So type safety and mutability, Swift and Objective-C do this totally different. In Objective-C, um, there was a lot of classes, so you had uh, NS Array, NS Mutable Array was its brother or sister class that made it mutable. In Swift, we don't have that concept anymore. In Swift, we also have everything, all, all of these types are pretty much explicit. Even though you can also use uh, inferred types, they become explicit when you go to compile your code. So there'll never be a time where your compiler is like, I don't know what this variable should be, so I'm just going to make it like id or whatever. Um, or it just doesn't know at compile time, and then later on, you know, some sort of weird bug happens. So here's just a typical line of Swift. Let first name of type string equal Chris. I can also not have the colon string, and I can just set it to my last name, Ferrant. So the first one here is explicit, but you don't need to because Xcode knows that that's a string. It will never not be a string because it's not a number. It's a string, it's in, it's in quotes. Um, so when it goes to compile this, that becomes a Swift string. It accomplishes the same exact thing, it's just uh, really your preference. Really the, the main, um, more common way to do it would be the second line. Unless for some reason you have a more complex type, you can typically go with uh, just inferring them. Okay, so let is a constant. Swift is a very constant focused language. It wants you to use let the majority of the time. And this will save your butt because if you can't change constants, then somebody else can't change those same constants. So if there's user input somewhere in your code that is injecting some sort of like injection-like thing uh, and it's trying to write into a constant, that will never happen. So in general, read-only stuff in your code is going to be safer. You might have more lines of code, you might have an extra three lines for every one line that you would have a variable for, uh, but it's easier for you to reason with your code in terms of knowing exactly what is supposed to be where at compile time. It can also guarantee you uh, that what you want to be in that particular variable is correct. Okay, so as you see here, I changed my first name to We Like Beer. That would be a really sweet first name. Uh, probably I Like Beer would be more appropriate. Um, and you can see that Xcode's yelling at me. Try to change it to a different type totally. Xcode's like, nope, that's not going to work. It's not, not an integer. That's always been a string. So if I want to create a brand new uh, constant called full name, I could take first name and last name and kind of append them together. If these were uh, variables and, and this were, you know, I, I could append something into it and restore that value in there. But with let's, again, I cannot do that. These things are read only, every one of these lines so far. So variables begin with var. The equivalent of what I just did in Objective-C would be NS string is to NS mutable string. And, and those are pointer types. Swift is pointerless. It's a pointerless uh, language. They do have classes or actually structs that will allow you to interoperate with C. So if you have pointer code, uh, you can still store them. Um, but they make it very clear that enter at your own risk when you're doing something like that. And I'll show you later what that means. Okay, so with this particular variable, I can change it. I can also append to it. I can do stuff with it. I can restore it back in there. This example here, fact, is just one item. Up here, I have, all sort, I have three different things kind of storing information like that. Okay, so moving on down to string safety. Printf is dead in Swift, uh, which for all of the reasons that you saw earlier is probably a good thing. Um, the the whole format specifier uh, injection attack, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily happen by default. It's Swift is safe by default, and I'll show you where it could still be an issue. So printf does not, does not run. Let me go ahead and uncomment this class here. So I have a dog class, and I create a new dog. I Cortez my dog here. The equivalent to printf, and really nslog, if you're familiar with nslog in Objective-C, the replacement in Swift would be printline. And printline, you don't use format specifiers, you use something new called string interpolation, and it guarantees that what you're putting into that, or injecting into that bigger string, uh, is also a string. So it's not gonna be some sort of uh, operator that can read the stack or write data somewhere else or overwrite stuff or even get like memory pointers. 
This is string interpolation, and it's going to um, put my dog's name in here as Cortez. You can't see the results because I have it zoomed in here, but they're over on the right. So definitely be aware that because Swift does not run on its own, uh, there still is Objective-C runtime. You can still call Objective-C things. So this is part of the foundation framework, NSString. Um, one of the methods in there is just that allows you to create a string from format specifiers. This one here is showing you that you know I can still print out. I can still use those format specifiers. So percent %p, percent %x, um, percent %at, of course, in Objective-C prints the description of the object. So you can still call older frameworks, and we do. 99% of the time you're using the Cocoa libraries, and those are all Objective-C libraries. Uh, overflows, integer overflows. So this is not a thing in Swift. So we have a variable. Just get the number because I can't memorize what the max 64-bit integer is, but here it is. Stick it in a var, and I go and I try to add one to it. And you're not seeing it right now, but if I show you the console, it crashed. So, and that's a good thing. You want it to crash. You don't want it to do what? Wrap around, right? If you start seeing negative numbers there after I do that, then you're in trouble. You just change someone's checking account to like minus nine gazillion dollars. Um, so this is a good thing that lots of other languages do this, but you know this is new to iOS development. So it's protected from integer overflow. If, again, you want to shoot yourself in the foot, there are options for you to then go ahead and do that. Maybe you have a reason to, to do that kind of overflow pattern. Maybe that was part of what you wanted it to do. That particular data type uh, was to do that. You can use uh, a different operator, not the plus symbol, but at plus, or ampersand plus, I should say. And you'll notice that it went ahead and it, it did overflow. But again, safe by default. And that's not default. And then finally, array bounds checking. So you would hope that you could not access uh, the third item in here. You would want this to crash, and it does. It does not return like the junk that was in there and just is OK with it, uh, like something like a pointer language would do. Um, so we have array balance checking. So these are all things that you might be like, no, so does my language. This is great. Um, but in iOS development, these are new. Okay. So again, I already kind of pointed these out. Be aware, you're running on the Objective-C runtime still, so all of those issues are still there. Swift is just a, a library that gets added uh, when you compile it, for now. C standard library is still available, so you can still call older C uh, functions. If you have libraries that do like charting or graphing or something really awesome, some scientific thing, don't worry, you can still use that stuff, but again, from a security standpoint, you need to know that you are accessing that stuff, and you're going to need to deal with pointers. In Swift, we use the type uh, unsafe pointer, hence the term unsafe, and they call it right out in the type so that you know exactly what you're getting into at that point. Okay, so with all this cool stuff, what could possibly go wrong? Plenty. So just because I talked about Swift and trust and all these cool things that Apple gives you uh, does not mean that the app itself is... Um, not leaky, not, not secure in general. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that could go wrong, and this is just kind of a sample list of some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, and you're probably looking at these saying, well, yeah, that's, those are pretty bad on desktops as well as mobile. Um, and these really have nothing to do with vulnerabilities in the frameworks or the APIs. They have mostly to do with developers not knowing enough about security to integrate that into uh, a, a good secure app. So that is uh, app time. We're going to write an app. I'm not going to write it. I already wrote it. I saved it as a snapshot. Xcode has a great feature uh, called snapshots that lets me just take a snapshot of it in time, kind of like VMware. Um, it does crash every once in a while in Xcode. So if it crashes, please bear with me. It's not my fault, I promise. We do a little role plan. We have a guy named Kevin. He is in the crowd. Uh, buy him a beer and thank him for me. Uh, or Thank him for me so that uh, he doesn't get mad at me for using his picture. So he's our app developer. He's actually an app critique analyst, but he's, he's going to be our developer guy. He's got this great idea, he, and you know he constantly brings me ideas. He's got this idea called Keymaster, and this is a sweet app. Very novel idea. You probably have never seen anything like this app before in your life. This is like, you might actually go home and 
find an iOS developer to write this app for you and try to make money yourself. Um, Kevin is also a fan of what movie? Ghostbusters, that's right. All right, there's people that are as old as me in here, that's good. Um, so we have Keymaster and we have a mascot. This is our devil dog guy from Ghostbusters. Keymaster basically stores secrets. So your internet favorite websites or whatever, you just want them really convenient on your phone. You want to be able to see them because you don't want to remember them anymore. And you don't trust you know, these crazy cloud keychains or these other companies. So you just want your own app. Um, and maybe Kevin's even writing this for an enterprise. So he's going to give this app out to his entire company because he thinks it's so useful. He's going to be able to store all these cool secrets in there. All right, so let's have a look and see what this thing actually does. If you're all interested in how I'm doing this, this is just QuickTime. It's very cool. A little trick you can do is plug your phone in, open up QuickTime, don't shake it. Come on. <laughs> oh, no. Come on back. Yes. Okay. So you open up QuickTime, and then when you go to record, there's this little red button down here. Just don't record, just choose your iPhone camera, and it'll actually show you the screen, which is pretty neat. So we have Keymaster 1.0. Uh, here's the basics of it. You, bas you basically tap to create uh, an account, and I'm gonna choose a shopping account. I'm gonna go ahead and add my Amazon account in here, because I use it all the time. And shopper. Good old pass one, two, three, very secure password. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. Okay, so it's definitely saved it, it's, it's written there. I can go back a screen just to make sure. Uh, go back into shopping, it's working. Can minimize it, can maximize it, oops. Okay, so it's good to go. It's pretty basic. Oh, and one other thing, I can, it's got this feature that I can, um, tap on it to see the actual entries, of course, and then I can copy it. I can hit copy here and it copies it. So I can go paste it somewhere because I'm lazy and I don't want to type it in. Very interesting. So you probably are like, whoa, that's very risky. That Hopefully they're doing that correctly. How do you even do something like that correctly? We got to call Eddie in on this. Eddie's here too, buy him a beer also. He's, he's got the mean looks on these slides, so don't make fun of him. Um, Eddie's an app critique analyst, and he's looking at Kevin's app, the enterprise developer, and he's saying, whoa, this is, you know, we got problems here. There's definitely some issues going on here. You cannot put this out via our MDM. We're going to lose all sorts of data. So here's some of the main problems. First of all, Kevin, you're storing this data in something called user preferences. And this is, it sounds silly, but this is still a thing. Developers still store critical data in user preferences. User preferences, when I think of user preferences, I'm thinking like the color of the title bar and like the time zone I'm in and like, you know, things that are just not really that important that I want to customize this app on. And that's what user preferences is supposed to be for. There's a class in a foundation called NS user defaults. On Apple, user defaults are user preferences. This class stores all that stuff for you and the developer can just like write one line of code and it goes somewhere. And they're happy because it comes back when they ask for it. Data protection is left default. Well, Kevin doesn't even know about data protection. What is data protection? He had no clue. So we got to look into that. And also, no background cleanup. So there's a lot of forensic artifacts that are kind of saved that iOS just does. The developer had no clue that it was happening. Uh, and this is more for the convenience of the user using the app. So again, my point uh, being, don't stick stuff in user preferences. It's not a database. It is a single file. That file is a plist, which was talked about already today. Here's a simple line of code that saves that data, that Amazon account with the username and password. Uh, it's just a, a standard class called NS user defaults, and the uh, method's called set object. And all I'm doing is taking a dictionary, this entries dictionary, which you don't see here, but it's in my code. Um, and it's saving it into a, a dictionary, NS user defaults, as the at the entries key. That file is forensically available at this location here. And every app has one if they're saving preferences to it. Uh, the app bundle ID in, in this case here would be like com.totem.keymaster um, version one, something like that. Plists or XML, it's like Apple XML. Uh, they come in two flavors. You have plain text, which you can just open up in Notepad. You can view it. 
Sometimes you don't even need to open it. You can just preview it, and preview shows it to you with the spacebar. Um, or they're binary, which with PLUtil, you can uh, convert back to clear text, XML. So both of these files you can see. Let's go ahead and show you that. So the tool I'm going to use to present uh, that file is called iExplorer. And it also likes to be reloaded when you're doing stuff like I am on stage. So unfortunately, I can't make this any bigger. But as you can see here in my sandbox, I have an app called Keymaster. And here's my sandbox. My phone is uh, unlocked, by the way. I have a documents folder, which is empty. I have a library folder, caches, preferences. And there's my file. And it actually has stuff in it. We can hit space here. And sorry about the font pixelation. But this is just XML. And you know, assuming you get past all of the layers or you get access to the device while it's unlocked, this is what you would be seeing right now. Um, in this particular case, you'd actually be able to get this if the device was locked, just because of the data protection that Kevin didn't know about that we're going to teach him in a minute. So we have uh, Account Mad Shopper, Amazon, Password123, PList. All things bad here, not a whole lot of good going on. So let's talk about data protection. Oh, too far, go back one. It's the price you pay for having animations in your keynote. So data protection in general, uh, let's just ignore the fact that Kevin's saving to user preferences. Data protection by default now, and this was not um, this way for very long. Um, recently, not within the last year, but maybe iOS 7, uh, started putting data protection on your sandbox. And the actual setting is called NS File Protection Complete until first user authentication. And what that means is that means after you reboot your phone, as soon as you unlock it, that is the first user authentication. When was the last time you guys rebooted your phone? You know, probably a while ago. Uh, some of you, maybe weeks. It depends. Um, so that is the default data protection that you get without doing anything in Xcode. Uh, which is not great. It's not, you know, superb. It lets me see that file while this device is locked. So what are my other options? You have four options total. You have one that's pretty much not an option, none. Um, and then you have the completes suite, which is complete, the best one. You should be using that one unless there's a reason not to. Uh, unless open, meaning like if the file was just written and it's open, maybe it's like a notification that came in or an email and it needs to be like the summary needs to be shown on your lock screen or whatever. While it's open, uh, you know, it, you can read it, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't be able to read the text. And then as soon as you lock it, it's complete. And then the default, which is the bottom one. You change these in Xcode either two ways. Uh, one way, at the project level, you can say, okay, everything is going to change now. We're going to change that default level to a better level. We're going to toggle this switch under capabilities, turn on data protection, and by default, if you log into your iTunes developer portal, you'll see that the default um, permission protection at that point switches to complete. Or you could not do that at all, and you could do it on a much more micromanagement scale per file. Most of the uh, foundation framework types that write to disk do not let you put the protection at that, in that line of code. You then have to add it later. So in this example here, we created the file a few lines above it, and then we added attributes, just this simple dictionary here, file protection complete, we set that on the file that we're saving. And that then kind of ups it per that file. The rest of the sandbox is still, you know, the default level. You can use a combination of both also. All right. So the last problem with this app was that, you know, it had a bunch of artifacts hanging around. So we got to do a little spring cleaning. Really showing my age now, but this is definitely the best video game that's ever been made. That's a strong statement, right? Uh, pasteboard. So when you hold your finger down and you copy something in iOS, it goes somewhere. It doesn't just go into the ether and that ether isn't secure. It actually goes to a general pasteboard unless the developer created their own named pasteboard for just their apps, which is much more secure. Um, but that might not suffice what you're trying to do. There could be text field caching going on. And this changes with every iOS release. Um, there's a there's a file called dynamic-text.dat, 
and it tracks things like autocorrection. So when you're typing out, you know, that little red underline or that semi-annoying thing that just changes your word on you before you send that text message, there's a dictionary and it keeps track of things that you've corrected. You said, no, that's, that is correct. Don't mess with my text. Uh, that stuff gets stored somewhere. It gets cached. And that's not in your sandbox. That's elsewhere. And then also, uh, snapshot images. Most of you probably have heard this one. This is like the one that OWASP has been screaming about since the very first iPhone. So, or the first iPhone that could multitask. So you hit the home button, your app goes in the background. And then double tap the home button, you can see all your apps running. Well, they're not really running. Those are just images. Um, and if, you're, if these are images, they gotta be stored somewhere. If you lose your phone, and some were able to get into your phone, um, maybe your banking app has a username and password on it, but maybe the last time you minimized that app, you had all your account information on the screen, or maybe your username. Uh, that stuff gets a picture taken of it and stored into the file system. Let's go show you that. This thing keeps wanting to go horizontal on me. <laughs> okay, so I definitely minimized the, oh, maybe I didn't. Let's go ahead and do that. So first thing, if I double tap this, well, let's make it worse. So I'll send this home. I'll bring it back up. So as you can see, that's clearly visible, right? So there's that image is somewhere in iOS. Also, when I'm in here, I copied the password just to prove. Oops, not, not numbers, I don't want that. Give me Evernote. Okay, I go to paste, and I'm in a totally different app, pass one, two, three. Now I did that via user interaction, but that could have been grabbed via code. So another app on the device that could be running in the background via one of those nine reasons can just go to the general pasteboard and say, give me the array that, that's been stored in you. And now it has you know, this type of information. You might be thinking, well, why would you even put that feature in this app? I did it on purpose. So it, this, this particular example probably is definitely not something you want to do. All right, how do you mitigate that? Um, I already said this, you know, you use named passport, passports, uh, but those passports, but those only work for your um, developer app group. Uh, blur or scrub the screens or do something, get rid of the data before the app goes down uh, and gets minimized. Disable autocomplete on text fields. This is kind of annoying, but um, you know, you, and this, these are things that are very often missed just because how many text fields are in every app? You know, there's a ton. And most developers don't know that there's even, or why would you turn autocomplete off? Like, it's useful, right? Uh, there's also a secure entry text field, which you know, most apps do use for the password field. In this app, it doesn't make sense to do that because the whole point is to see the password, not dots. Okay, so let's see what Kevin did. Version two came out, he's all proud of his work. So this thing better be bulletproof, otherwise Eddie is gonna be not a happy camper. Okay. All right, so first off, go ahead and create a quick account. Amazon, spelled wrong, whatever. Username, password, user imagination. Click OK. All right, so it's in here. It's definitely getting stored correctly, or maybe not correctly, but it's getting stored. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and send this to the background. What's that? Oh, the Galaxy? Because uh, I have that. Uh, dynamic thing turned on on the home screen. Sorry about that. Oops. So now that I have uh, written this account, I'm going to go back to iExplorer. Works best when you unplug and replug. So Kevin did go in here in version two and check off this uh, on toggle. And he also, on the entry screen, added a hook 
to listen for when the application goes into the background, and you have to do this, it's called a notification. This is how a developer would kind of inject their say before this app literally got pushed into the background and screenshot was taken. So I'm adding a blur effect to that in that nanosecond that I'm given. And then also, on the, the whole app entirely, when it goes into the background, Kevin decided to just use a sledgehammer to kill an ant here and to clear the entire general pasteboard. So there's a uh, app will resign delegate callback that you have access to as a developer, and I'm just setting it to just blank, just wipe it out. That's going to wipe out everything. Again, sledgehammer ant, but it uh, kind of shows you the, the point I'm trying to make. Probably should just get rid of that whole copy feature. That would be much easier. Okay, so back to iExplorer. Not loving me right now. Show me my sandboxes. There we go. Okay, I have Keymaster version one, and I showed you that before. Preferences library. There's my plist. It's definitely in the clear. I go to Keymaster version two. This one, for some reason, is using my same sandbox. This should not be readable. But again, live demo in this talk. OK, well, I'm not going to futz around with it because I don't have much time. But that's, that's the stuff that you would need to do to actually uh, mitigate that. So data protection is very important. Um, more importantly, preferably not store that stuff in user preferences. Uh, update 3 and Update 4 are, and you guys can have access to the source code, I'll, I'll put it up on my website after the talk, um, essentially taking the data out of user preferences and storing them as straight up flat files. So Kevin thought that, you know, the user preferences thing is definitely not a good idea. Let's go ahead and use the built-in APIs to save files. We did that. Um, Eddie's not happy with that. You know, he, you, the reason being when you save using like foundation classes, uh, those things also get saved as plists. So not only is your user preferences not a database, it's a plist, but so are all of the files that you use uh, or that get written when you call write to file from an array or a dictionary. Um, definitely use them because they're nice and convenient, but don't store any sensitive information in them because they're just text files. You can open them up, they're XML. This is the uh, typical thing that you would see in an app that's just storing right from a, a dictionary in this case here. It's writing out uh, category description, account, and password right to a dictionary. Update four, uh, Kevin said, okay, we're getting rid of plists because you clearly do not like those, Eddie. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say core data is probably what we should be doing right now. That's, well, that's Kevin, Kevin is saying this. Getting a little warmer, the problem is that core data, which is the normal main repository that, that developers use to store their data, uh, is not secure either. So the entire database is not encrypted, and it's just a SQLite database that you can use a tool like iExplorer to go and open up. Um, you, iExplorer will get you there, and then you can use something like SQLite Inspector to open up the tables and, and read them all in the clear. Uh, if you are going to use core data and you're going to store sensitive data and it may be encrypted before it goes in, core data also has a data protection uh, policy, and the default is still uh, until first authentication. So you can change that. Just like with regular files, you have to increase it to that complete level. Okay, um, five is hopefully one that I can get to work here. So this would be the proper way in a normal environment should be to use the keychain. So the keychain is a built-in encrypted database in iOS. There's one that all, ac all apps have access to. And it is a C library. And essentially what that means is that uh, you either learn it, go look at the developer documentation around it, or uh, go get yourself you know, a nice third party library from CocoaPods or GitHub. Let me try to restore this one more time. Okay, 
So you can see that I'm still writing some files here, but what I'm writing in them is definitely not the password. You'll see up here this dictionary doesn't have the password in it anymore. And I'm actually writing the password right here in the keychain. So I'm getting access to the iOS keychain. I'm setting it to uh, set this device only, set the key in, and add it. And once I add it, and this is nice and easy because I am using a third-party library uh, from, from GitHub. Once I add it, uh, I'm good to go, and I can retrieve it from uh, my app as long as I know the key that I put in. OK, on top of that, Kevin got um, Touch ID working. So not only does it have, let's try to get it on here. You guys are probably getting seasick, seeing all the swipes going back and forth. Sorry about that. OK. So Keymaster loads at some point. There we go. So when I go into my shopping cart to see all of my shopping accounts, um, Kevin figured out Touch ID. He added it. Uh, so in order to even get to this screen now, I have to do local authentication on the device. And then I can actually get in here. Touch ID is great. It's really easy to, in to institute. It's like two lines of code. Uh, and not only does it just work just for whatever reason you wanted to use it for, you can add it to keychain items so that when your app goes and pulls from the keychain, if a particular setting is added to that item, it'll pop up the local authentication in order for you to even get access to it. I realize I'm running out of time here, so let me get through this section. We'll skip questions now, and I can have questions you know, over beers or whatever. So here's those permissions I was talking about. Uh, the default for your keychain items is uh, when unlocked, but you have access to you know, six or seven other uh, ways you can put that item into the keychain. C-based API, go grab yourself a library. Touch ID, the framework that you use is called local authentication. So if you see somebody, if you're doing um, analysis of an app and they're using this framework, they're definitely looking at um, the Touch ID mechanism on the device and using it for something. Uh, it does have a, an option to have a password fallback. OK. Update 6 was the Apple iWatch. Um, I'll let you guys play around with that on your own time if you have a watch. But you can actually run this project that I'll put up on the site in the simulator. Um, the point I wanted to make is that, and this happens with every piece of new technology that comes out, be aware that the old problems always, dis always uh, wind up coming to the top again. So just because you have this new shiny device and you want to put apps out into the App Store very quickly uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep in mind the security aspects of it. Uh, in order to write to the watch, you don't actually write data to the watch. The, the iPhone itself or the, the iPad or whatever you're using to sync up with um, has an app extension that uses WatchKit. And a second piece called a WatchKit extension gets installed into your phone. Uh, you can turn on app groups, and that creates almost like a second little sandbox or a little container. And that container is shared between all apps that you own as a developer, including the Apple Watch. So when you want to push like those shopping accounts or uh, your secrets over to the watch, the watch will actually go to the, uh, that shared container on your phone to get the data. The same rules apply. Don't do plists with clear text. Uh, you know, protect your SQLite databases. Um, all the rules we talked about before. Just because you're creating a new container and iExplorer can't see it right away, you can see it in backups because it's a shared group. Um, so you can get access to that stuff. Just make sure that it's secure. To turn on app groups, it's just a switch in Xcode. Um, once you have a, an ID, your container gets created. Eddie's not happy with Kevin's quick decision to put you know, clear text files into this WatchKit extension, but he is happy enough to get a watch himself. So. He's at least uh, he's progressing along with technology. Uh, so shared container storage. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at it too much. I've only had the watch for a little over a week. So um, you know, there's probably a lot of little nuances that best practices will still take care of. OK, so quick lessons learned. Let me try to get them all on the screen quick here. We covered most all of these. Um, the bottom one is probably the most important. Just determine whether or not you should be even storing that type of data. Uh, this final section here, and I know that I'm done, but uh, I'll, you can take a look at these slides yourself. They're just random topics. Things like hard coding strings is never a good idea. Um, 
developers leave stuff like API keys and usernames and passwords for test accounts, uh, test URLs, all sorts of stuff in binaries. Double check code uh, before stuff you know, gets deployed. It's always a good idea. Maybe move the API keys elsewhere, maybe have it do some uh, HTTPS get request to go get them, um, but then you're dealing with some other kinds of issues. Be careful with NS log, it, it logs to the console as another talk already talked about today. Um, in Swift, just print, use print line. Just skip over NS log completely. Uh, SysControl, if you've seen this used in an app, they're probably using it to like look at the processes running on it or to look at like a net stat like uh, process, um, network connections list, things like uh, endpoints that may or may not need to be there depending on what they're doing, if they're doing it for good or bad. Uh, serialization. So all of those files that we were writing to disk, those are basically objects that get de uh, serialized to a file format. That protocol, in order to do that, is actually called NS coding. Um, if you were an attacker and you were to swap out that file with some other file that was a plist or was a some other object, NS coding is cool with that. And it's like, I'll just de unwrap you, I'll deserialize you. That's called an object sub substitution attack. Sounds pretty crazy, but it's, it, it's not a, uh, a very um, blatant, doable thing. Um, but there is a protocol that you probably should use, and most, most of the newer stuff is using it, called NS Secure Coding, which guarantees that what it unwraps from the file is the same type. Uh, so that if you put a dog object to disk, what comes back has to be a dog object, otherwise you know, that, that particular deserialization does not work. I'm not gonna get into networking in here, you guys already are probably pros on uh, always using HTTPS when in doubt. Um, certificate pinning is important. It's super easy to do. If your app always connects to the same website, um, go get the certificate of it, bring it back and store it in the bundle. And then at uh, development time, well, I should say put it in the bundle at development time. At runtime, produce two NS data objects, one from your certificate and one from the one you just got the challenge response from. Uh, create NS data objects and then just do a compare. URL cache, uh, just think desktop when you're thinking URL cache. Yes, this stuff gets cached. You can choose to make it so that it skips the cache entirely. Analytics libraries, if you use them, be careful. Uh, make sure that they are up to date. If you're using a third party analytics company, the early stuff was very cowboy, uh, wild, wild west, where HTTP was used all over the place. And the data that they're allowed to use when, when developers install these libraries, they can pull any data that they want from your app and send it back to you know, third party servers so that they can then log in and see how many pieces of pizza you're eating today or you know, where you last played golf, whatever. Um, keep them up to date, read the privacy policies, read the opt out stuff, it's very important. Um, and make sure that they're actually following that. Uh, you know, we've seen crazy stuff get sent in the clear and the developer never knew because all they do is add this framework and they think they're good to go with analytics. Now they have these charts and graphs and sweet things, but if you just open up Wireshark and take a look at what's actually getting sent back, it's pretty interesting. Could also be a data storage concern because that stuff gets cached. Um, I, I think that's probably pretty much all we have. Uh, iBeacons. A lot of people get freaked out about these things. These are like read-only broadcast type um, devices. So they're sending out Bluetooth, um, three numbers, a UUID, a major and a minor, uh, and that's it. That's all these things do. They just constantly scream out, hey, I'm this, I'm this. Um, the scenario where they would actually be uh, kind of used in an attack would have to be very crafty. They can be spoofed. Uh, there is no authentication layer by default. So if you do use beacons, maybe choose a vendor that has some sort of authentication layer that they baked into their APIs. And do you really care if someone spoofs your beacon? It depends on, on what it is used for, really. Uh, I have a ridiculous scenario here of basically a person uh, spoofing a beacon from a store. Uh, and they're, they're sitting in a, a coffee shop that everyone that comes into this coffee shop has that app from that store. You can easily stand up that beacon in that coffee shop and then all of a sudden make everyone's app that has, or everyone's phone that has that app just chatting to maybe these analytics companies that we talked about that are sending stuff over HTTP. So you're basically making the phone kind of, uh, you know, just puke out, puke out all of this awesome data that, that is uh, being released. Uh, so things like PII could be anything, really. Okay. Third party code, update it. 
because I know you all use third-party code. So further reading, other than the slides that I had to rip through real quick and the, the sample code I have, this is some great stuff up here. Uh, OWASP has, has always been a great source. You know, it gets updated every so often, but it's still all applicable stuff that we find in app critique uh, assessments all the time. Of course, the internet, read, read. Um, here's my contact information. Thanks for listening, and I hope you got something you know that you didn't know before you got here. <laughs>